and welcome once again to computer object oriented programming this is part five we're actually going to do some programming kind of sort of and again the course materials are available by going to that tinyurl.com link shown below So, why are we doing all this stuff? Why don't we just start with, you know, the traditional hello world program that every other class starts with. And the reason is that object-oriented programming is n not the way that a typical brain thinks. It's not like traditional thinking. And if we just start programming, it's sort of like giving a race car to someone that's never driven. They wouldn't know what to do with the with the controls. They wouldn't even know how to start the thing. So I want you to go ahead and review the class tree that we created back in part one of vehicles. And by now you should have realized that it has a great big problem. What if a trailer has four wheels? Well, it wouldn't have fit in our tree because we only had a tree for one wheel and two wheels but then you would have to redefine so many things for this trailer. Well, that just seems like a waste of space, time, effort, and so on and so forth. So we're going to introduce a new concept called superclasses. Now let's look at a different strategy for categorizing our vehicles. Looking at a motorcycle in particular, it's got several major components. Maybe it has more, but let's just look at these. It has a motor, a chassis, a drivetrain, transmission, brakes, body, electronics, and other accessories. Interestingly, most of these, or many of these, can be used in other devices. And each of those things, like say the motor, themselves have a class tree. They are objects in the sense of object-oriented programming. So a motorcycle is really a class that incorporates a whole bunch of other classes. By incorporating those classes, they become attributes of, say, the motorcycle class. And we're going to go ahead and do an example. So if we look here on the screen, we have one second. Yes. We have a very fancy uh, toy there, and I'm going to call that a horse hand. Um, now, if you look at that, it's several objects coming together to form a superclass. There's two component objects, the horse head and the horse foot. Now, we can define this class as is written here on the screen, and I'm going to go ahead and let you look at that because there's a lot of information and I'm not just going to read it because that's just boring. So go ahead and look at it real quick. Okay, we're back. So brown and gray horse hands, now it's defined, right? So horse hand is a class and it incorporates two other classes. Everything highlighted in the previous screen is stuff that we've discussed. Everything highlighted in that light lime color are just arbitrary names we've chosen for the variables. And the red letters are keywords and they're methods that are used in Python. Python is great because there are very, very few of these special words. So now let's create two instances of horse hand because we're going to have a race, of course. So in the main program, we would find a constructor for horse hand, and it's expecting a color. So we're going to design, define a new object called racer1, and that's going to be equal to horse hand brown, because we want a brown horse hand like the picture showed us. And then racer2 is going to be horse hand gray, because we just like the gray color. So now we have two instances, two individuals of the object horse hand, racer1 and racer2. And this is a new word in object-oriented programming speak. We call that instantiation. And yes, Cambridge Dictionary says that's an actual word. 
So in Python, we typically use all capitals for constants. We use a beginning lowercase letter for variables and methods, and we start class definitions with uppercase, and every single Python language item and keyword is in underscores and all lowercase. So use these conventions because it'll make your job easier both in reading other people's code and other people reading your code and your code you know that you wrote two years ago reading that again python as many many languages are case sensitive so racer one and racer one with different capital letters are two different things and that can actually be handy but let's save that for a more advanced class so how do we access attributes in Python? Python uses dots to separate the attributes from the objects. So racer1, num feet, well that would be equal to four, right? Because if you remember the definition of the class, num feet is set to four. Racer1 dot head dot color, that would be brown because color is an attribute of horse head and head is an attribute of horse hand. I know, think about that for a second. Racer one dot feet bracket zero. Well, that would be the first instance of the horse foot class. Why the first? Because remember, the number line starts at zero. So zero, one, two, three, four, five, all the way to infinity. Racer one dot feet that belongs to the horse hands, I'm sorry, to the racer one instantiation of the horse hand class. If you look at the horse hand class, it had an, a list called feet. And as we said, bracket zero is the first item. Now racer two dot feet zero dot color, well that would be gray. If you remember, we made racer two gray. And if you read the screen, again, feet is an attribute of the instance of horsefoot that we called racer2. Now, wow, that's a lot of stuff, and I'd like you to review that at your leisure. Next, we're going to go ahead and start some of the Python syntax. I want to review what uh, Cheeto, because he's... Dutch, not Italian. I know it looks like Guido, but in Dutch you would pronounce that Cheeto. But Cheeto, when he invented Python, he wanted beautiful better than ugly, explicit better than implicit, simple better than complex, complex better than complicated, and readability counts. All of those things are show up all over Python. And it was instrumental, and it's why Python is one of the leading worldwide um, languages for rapid application development. You can take a, an idea and create an application very, very, very quickly. In the next sections that you're going to see on the screen, anything you see in red are language words, reserved words that you can't although sometimes you're allowed to, but you definitely should never use for variable names. Multiple statements could theoretically be placed in one line, but it is considered bad style and it may be deprecated in future releases. So don't even start doing it that way. Python does not use curly braces or semicolons or tabs to delimit blocks. And if you've ever worked with a programming language that uses curly braces or semicolons, you'll sometimes find yourself spending hours debugging a program because it's missing a semicolon somewhere. And that really gets obnoxious. So we don't do it that way. In Python, you use empty white space to indent your blocks. And four spaces is sort of the quasi-standard what most people use, four or five. I like four. We're going to start with the Boolean operators, and I'm not really going to read every one of these things for you because, again, who wants to read from a screen and it would just bore you to death? Plus, the whole point of this is that you can print 
out these pages and it would be a great little cheat sheet for you. So Boolean operators are the ones that you would use to determine if something is equal to or if you say something like if this happens and that happens so that kind of thing that's boolean operators and you see the five of them right there the next we're going to do comparison operators now this is usually done between numbers although sometimes for strings and other other reasons but you have the the less than the greater than you know the equal to not equal to now the interesting one is in in is a word and I guess I should have put it in red but let's say that you have a string and the string contains the word Carol and you want to know if the letter a is inside that string well you could say if a is in Carol and boom it looks through the whole list and if it finds it it gives you true if it doesn't find it it gives you a false pretty neat stuff math operators the standard addition subtraction multiplication is done with an asterisk and a dual asterisk is power so x asterisk asterisk y is x being raised to the y um, you have more math operators here um, absolute value is abs when you want to just get the integer part of something, you use INT. If you want to convert an integer into a floating point number, you use float. Round gives you, you know, if you want to round the number up or down to a certain number of places. If you say two places, it would be two places after the decimal. If you put negative two places, it would be two places before the decimal. So it would be like to the nearest hundred. X division slash division slash Y is integer division. So you take two numbers, you use that, and you get an integer result. If you want to know what the remainder is, you use that percentage sign. And that particular function divmod gives you both answers. And there's a link there where you can look and find more, um, more of these little operators and whatnot. Okay, the next thing is Python syntax. Again, there's a list that you can see on the screen. And there's a link if you really want to see what all of them are. These are the ones that you're going to use the most. False, true, and none we talked about. Um, then there's break, class, continue, and everything else you see there. Again, these are the most common ones. Inside of a string, if you want to include a tab or a new line, you would put backslash T, backslash N, as you see there. There's an example. I want to end with a new line. You see it says end with a new line, backslash N. All of that is inside the quotes. If for whatever reason you actually want the backslash to show up, well, then you have to put backslash, backslash. You can enclose a string with either single quotes or double quotes. And that's pretty cool because say you want to have your variable include the words John's house and it needs an apostrophe, well, then you just do double quotes for the string. If you need both, you can see on the screen how it's done. When you are composing numbers, say you want to put x equals 1 million or x equals 1 billion, well, it's a pain in the butt to count all those zeros. So when you're doing numbers, underscores are ignored. So you can do 1 underscore 000, zero, zero underscore 000, zero, zero, and that's the same as writing 1 million. It's just a whole heck of a lot easier to read. All right, we're going to look at these keywords. Again, you have a link there. These are the most common ones on the left. The ones on the right are not as common, but they're very good to know. Um, interestingly, there's two ways to do comments. If you do an, a pound sign that starts a single line comment, and you can put that anywhere on the line. If you do three single quotes at a time, 
that starts and ends a multi-line comment. Next we have the even trickier stuff. And again, I'll let you read this on your own time because it's no point of me just reading the thing. Um, there's the quirky stuff over there, which sometimes could be something that gets you in, a, you know, you forget about it, gets you in trouble. Um, the one at the very bottom on the right hand side, if you want to run a procedure, it has to have the parentheses, even if it doesn't need any parameters. But if you don't use the parentheses, then instead of telling the machine that you want to run the procedure, you're actually asking for a pointer to that method. So just keep that in mind. Next are the syntax for the if statements. Computer programs are useless unless they can make decisions and the number one way of making decisions are if statements. You can have an if, else if, else if. You can do that an infinite number of times. You can have an else, as you see there. You can run a loop with the while statement. There is no until at Python, only whiles. Um, and whiles also have an optional else. I'll let you look at that again on your own time. And lastly, we have a very useful function called range. Range gives you a list, so you don't have to do 4x equals 1, 2, 10, blah, blah, blah. You just say range. And again, I invite you to read this at your, le at your leisure. Lastly, you have the syntax for a for loop. Okay, I hope you enjoyed that because with that introduction, we can now start writing programs, which is what the next, um, the next part of this sequence is going to be. All right, I hope you enjoyed that and uh, see you next time.